today you may be down you may feel like God has somehow forgotten you are faced with circumstances you can't get through and right now it seems like there's no way out these last few days you felt like you were going under but God's proven time and time again he'll take care of you yes he has and he'll do it conference because he wanted you to know today that he knows the things you've been going through and he knows how you're hurting in fact last week he's been there and he's seen it every single time when your heart broke in two he brought you here though to remind you he's still the God of the stars of the sun and the seas and that God is your father and today he's gonna calm the storm and he's gonna find some way to fix this for you when you love him he'll do it Just let me tell you one thing I know. I know he'll do it. He'll do it again. Because he promised you he would. He's going to do it again. Give him praise, ladies. Come on. 
give him praise. Come on, just because of his faithfulness. Oh, because there's no God like him. There's no God like him in heaven or earth. There's no God like him in heaven or earth. Oh, you are faithful and you are good and you are true and you are sure. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah to my God. Well, glory to God, you may be seated, I guess so, my Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. I love it. I'm going to go to a different key, so hang on one second. There's an old song that comes out of my heart in Psalms 119. I love this word that says, let me look it up since I quote the beginning of it. Uh, Jesus, listen to this one. By the way, Psalms 119 is a little lengthy, but dear Lord, that whole chapter, when you're in those kind of places, nothing like it. Listen to this one. Psalms 119, 161 says, Powerful people harass me without cause, but my heart trembles only at your word. I love that. My heart trembles only at your word. Not by what I see, my heart trembles when you speak. And that word is everything. That's what we stand on. It's what we live on. We're not moved from it. I was singing, I was singing uh, to myself over these last few days, those old hymns. You know, I've noticed that whenever I'm in the tough places, it's those old songs that come out of me. You know, it's the old hymns. that, that They are the, the sort of the bedrock of my faith. And I found it interesting that Every time it seems like in those hard places, I'm walking down the old dirt road singing, Though the tempest rages, I will not be moved. I'm on the rock of ages, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. That scares hell. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Come on. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Give God praise if you believe that. So, his word so powerful, so true and sure. I want to give you a little happy news. This is a miracle in itself, and I'm a little bit, whew, I don't know if giddy, I don't know beyond that, a little beside myself excited. This is a little bit of a dream come true. Um, it's, it's just sort of faith becomes sight. And something I never dreamed would happen on this subject. I had dreamed someday I would do this, but, but not on what it ended up to be. But this conference, in the morning, bright and early, my first book will be here. Yeah. Yeah. This is a miracle. A miracle. This book was five years in the living and one year in the writing, all right? And uh, it's, it's just, it's, I, I, I wrote for months feverishly because I wanted it for you. And I, I had determined at this women's conference, I so believe that God is going to bring specific women there for this particular message. And I, I mean, I know you could have bought it later, but I felt like, no, I want it for the women's conference. I want those women that are coming to that conference to have this message when they leave. I knew that God was bringing you here for this reason. So I fought for this thing because last week they called and said, book won't be there for women's conference. It'll be the next week. I said, no, no. <laughs> I will not be, I will not be moved. The book's going to be there. <laughs> it's Jesus' name. The book's going to be there. So um, some incredible men from Ramp Church right now are literally en route driving from a 12-hour drive from Ohio where they went and picked these books up when they were coming off the press and going into a box. Our men were going. For you. It's for you. 
It's, I could have waited until next week, but you couldn't. Come on. I could have waited a few more days, but I know you didn't need to wait another day. God brought you here this weekend for this word, and I knew that you were supposed to have this word. The book is called Watching the Road, and that is because uh, it is the story of my own story, but it's also the story of many of, of us, but it's especially the story, too, of the prodigal son's father who, when he saw his son coming afar off, he ran toward him. Why? Because that daddy was watching the road. Because that's what intercessors do. Intercessors keep their eye on the road all the time. And I know that this weekend I've been called here uh, and you have been called here together. And my, and my mission in your being here was, this is not a, a fake book or I'd give it to somebody. This is actually, I mean, this is not a real book. This is a fake book, just so you know. We just put a fake cover on the front. But, anyway. <laughs> but I knew that you were to be here because the mission that God has given me is that I'm to awaken intercessors for who God has called them to be. And I'm to stir up in you today purpose and faith to keep believing. And I was to awaken you to the, to the call of God on your life and the difference that you can make. And I was, to, I was to, by the Spirit of God and revelation, help you to understand your time is right now to make this difference and God needs you. There's no time to waste. He needs you fully on your post. I... To be really honest with you, I was telling Chosen and the, the girls in the back, leadership girls in the back, that um, before the service started, I said, I've struggled because I feel like some of these women have already heard this testimony before, and, you know, they're going to think, is that all she talks about? Well, kind of, yes. But <laughs> I do actually have other messages, but I don't feel to preach those other messages. I feel like Martha a little bit, who saw Lazarus raised from the dead. And probably for the rest of Martha's life, that's pretty much probably all she talked about. You know what I'm saying? Well, I saw Lazarus raised from the dead, and so that's pretty much all I can talk about. Those kind of things affect you deep. When Jairus' little girl came off the bed, that, they probably spent the rest of their lives saying, i got to tell you about this man that came to our house. Well, i got to tell you about a man who came to my house. Last night, I was sitting over here by my beautiful daughter, Lindsay. Lindsay, I want you to stand up. Will you do that? This, folks, is Lindsay Renee Doss. Lauren, I stand, keep standing, sweetheart. My other daughter, I only have two girls in the natural. I've got a lot of spiritual daughters, but my two blood daughters, Lauren, stand up. This is my oldest daughter, Lauren, and my youngest daughter, Lindsay. And uh, they're both in the ministry. Thank you, honey. Last night, I was sitting by Lindsay, and I was thinking about the scripture that said, you know, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the Pharisees wanted to kill not just Jesus, but Lazarus too. Because everywhere Lazarus went, they knew he was going to be a walking witness that the power of God was real and that Jesus was who he said he was. So I was sitting by Lindsay last night, and I just sitting by her just thinking, she doesn't even have to do anything. All she has to do is just sit right there in that seat and let me just do like this on top of her head to every one of you. And that ought to be enough to tell you there is nothing too hard for our God. But she will be saying something this afternoon, and I'm pretty fired up about that. <clears throat> that journey changed my life. I've served the Lord since I was a little girl eight years old, when I encountered God. And I've been through some tough places. 1987 was a hard place in the deep betrayal of a marriage. And um, in several years of that, that infidelity is a pain that's pretty indescribable. I've walked through some valleys and some places. But those, that journey with my daughter in 2014 and 2015 affected me in a way nothing else has ever affected me. Now, I don't know. I think there's probably a lot of mothers in here like me. But it's when it's your kids, it's, it's one thing for you to go through something and the enemy to attack you directly. But when he messes with one of your kids, I don't know if every mother's like this, but I think a lot of you are. You know, it's, I mean, you can mess with me, but you don't mess with her. I mean, I love her more than me. 
So there's a different fight in me when it comes to her, right? Yes. The whole journey probably, I say two years, in, in reality it was about five years, but I didn't know it until the last three. And then the last two of those five were by far the most intense. So I usually mostly discuss those last two years of what I call my journey of intercession. And in that journey, I learned some things in believing for her return that has so deeply impacted me. I am still unpacking all I, I came to understand. Um, for one thing, does, is there anyone here that doesn't know, really briefly, the story about Lindsay and what happened? Anybody raise your hand if you don't even know what I'm talking about. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Now, I sure know why you're here. All right. <laughs> my daughters have been raised in the ministry their whole life. I'm just going to skip like a rock on the water, so follow me. My daughters have been raised uh, serving the Lord, the presence of Jesus. And uh, I traveled with them on the road, carried them in my womb, actually doing concerts for 20 years by myself traveling. So, <clears throat> In 1998, when the Lord told me to come here to Hamilton and begin this youth work, my girls, Lindsay was 12, Lauren was 15. And so we just together were able to really birth something that was just such a joy to share a ministry together with my girls, seeing young people awakened, their friends, and these young ones' lives changed. So for the last 20 years, I've spent 20 years on the road by myself first. This is my 40th year, Jesus help us all. First 20 years by myself, and then the second 20 years has been with the ramp. In 2010, unbeknownst to me, Lindsay was really targeted by the enemy. I don't know how else to put it. She um, by then had married an incredible young man named Casey Doss, who is, who is full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Word. I was thrilled when she married him because I knew he was a man of integrity and just faith, and he was going to do just treat her well and take care of her in 2000 when Casey was the pastor of ramp church he was the director of the ramp school of ministry so you would understand then why the enemy would attack Lindsay <laughs> Lindsay here he is the pastor and the leader of our school and then Lindsay is over all chosen's choreography and she's putting together their dances and you can see why the enemy thought that's a good target because it will affect so many and uh a long story short, you can read the book and get the full story. <laughs> long story short, Lindsay began to change. And before I knew it, it was too late. And she had been changed from inside out. Suddenly, uh, her friend group began to change. Her looks began to change. Her attitude begins to change. And it was just so unthinkable to me because I'm thinking, how does a girl raised in the presence of God turn into someone that I've never known? How does, this, how does this even happen? And I can't say it wasn't overnight. It was one drip by drip of deception that just led her away until finally in 2000, the spring of 2014, she came to us and let us know she was leaving Casey, filing for divorce, leaving us as her family, leaving this place as the ramp, leaving her whole life that she has known and moving to another place and living a complete different life. Now, for us, for me, you talk about our world upside down. By this time, they have two precious little girls, Annalise and Katie. They're suffering. They're hurting. They're confused. Katie was five. Annalise was eight. It's right in there during a lot of this season. I mean, it was just so unthinkable that it was every, everything was affected. Of course, the ministry was affected, but it wasn't my main concern. I mean, I, I knew the ministry belongs to God. This girl is the mother's heart. My son-in-law, my grandchildren, that's my mother's heart. And as I began to, to see these things happening, and I'm going to God, and I'm in this unbelievable warfare, and the pain is just indescribable. And days are going on, and fasting, and prayer, and people are getting concerned about me. And one of the main things I began to hear from people who cared about me, and I understand that, but they begin to say, now, Karen, she's an adult. You're going to have to let her go to make this decision, and you're going to have to learn to go on with your life. You can't control her. You've got to find a way to somehow not let this destroy you too. She's made her decision, and Lindsay made that clear. One day when I asked her in my kitchen, 
what is your final answer after I've poured my guts out to her? And there's just no words when she looks back at you and says what her final answer is. And they're telling me, this is her answer. You've got to go on and learn to accept this. Now that began, you can answer it, but <laughs> that began. It may be the Lord calling you to say, you need to listen right now. <laughs> that began a war in my spirit like nothing I have ever faced in my life. To just hear this well-meaning counsel from godly people telling me I've just got to accept this. That was a real key place for me of struggle. My struggle was really? I mean really this whole Christian God faith life boils down to that the devil comes into my house, steals my daughter and I just have to somehow accept that? I've got to accept that? How do you move on with your life when your daughter's walking off a cliff? How do you just move on when you see her in an ocean drowning, completely drowning? How am I supposed to just swim off into my life and find a way to be okay? My struggle was because when I look at this situation, nothing about this situation looks like the will of God. There's despair, there's brokenness, there's sin, there's desperation, there's pain. There's nothing, there's complete destruction to a marriage. And nothing about that looks like my God. In fact, what this looks like is the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. My decision was, I've got to learn to accept that and go on. Or, I can go to the one I've served my whole life. Find out from that God, God, what do you, God, have to say about that thing? What is your word? What is your thought? What do you, God, have to say? I've heard what she has to say. I've heard what they have to say. What do you have to say about that thing right there? So this is, this is the battle. I can either accept this thing or I can stand right here in this place until that thing looks like that word. Come on. So I made my decision. I'm standing come hell or high water and hell and high water came. I am standing in this place until. As I began to walk through it, I didn't realize the lessons I was learning in it. I didn't even know I was just surviving every day. But there were some things that especially now that I'm out of it, I look back on and I'm realizing what I was learning that I had no idea of. It's all of what the book is about. One of the most important things I learned in that season is this. You do not have to just accept anything that is not the will of your father. You do not have to just accept anything that is not the will of God. That's why it's critical for you to know the will of God. It's, it's why you have, through prayer and searching and seeking, you've got to find out what God has to say about it. His word is everything. It's everything you're going to cling to. It's everything you're going to stand on. It's the only thing that won't be moved. You do not have to just accept anything not the will of God. One of the, one of the things that blew me away in that season was just how clear he will speak and let you know his will. I'm telling you what, I, he blew my mind. I had learned his voice as a child. But you know when he says he's near to those whose hearts are broken, you better believe it's the truth. And even if it's a long time broken, he'll just stay right there. I just felt like those whole two years. And, and I, could, I was just seeking him. Well, a lot of the two years. Some of the days were different. But a lot of the two years, I would just be like, Father, he'd go, yes. You know, it was just the nearness of his presence. For a large part of the journey. And the way he will speak to make it undeniable is beautiful. Because he knows your language. So he'll speak in ways that you have to know that's God. That is God. 
And he, you know, one word from God would be enough to last you for the rest of your life. In his sweet mercy, he'll give you as many words as you need. Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, if he just told you one time, this is my word, hang on to it until the end comes. Even if it's 36 years, you, just, you can still hang on that one word and that'll be just fine. But he's so sweet, he'll give you a word. And if you're wavering in 30 minutes, he ain't going to say, I ain't going to speak to you no more. No, if you're wavering in 30 minutes, he'll say, here's another word. Come on. If you're wavering in about six and a half hours, it's okay, baby. Here's another word. Come on. That's how good your father is. I think sometimes people don't understand that, how loud he will speak, how clear and how often. You know, recently on The View, a lady made the statement that people that hear from God have a mental condition. <laughs> I think people that claim to be Christians that don't hear from God, they have the problem. <laughs> if, you, if you claim to be a Christian, it should be the absolute norm. It's the normal part of a Christian life to hear from your father. To walk with him in that kind of intimacy. But people, a lot of Christians have such a view of God. They just think of him as just far away. You know, they just accept him. He's just, I accept him as the Lord of my life. And when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to go to church every Sunday morning and hear somebody tell me about God if I don't have to go to the lake. And so, and when I die, if there is a God, I'll go to heaven. And they just miss so much. Just accepting whatever life gives. When he's given us so much greater than just living a get saved, go to church, wait till you, Jesus comes and someday go to heaven. Hey, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. But I need him right now too while I'm waiting to go to heaven. And this, one, of the, one of the things that I find interesting are people, and I've had this said to me in, in different seasons, especially during that time, I remember hearing someone say, well, you know, if it's God's will, it's going to happen and nothing we can do is going to change that. If it's God's will, it's going to happen and nothing we can ever do is going to change that. If it's God's will to happen, it's going to happen and nothing we can ever do would change that. Now that just sat with me for a while and I began to ponder it. Really? Because if that is who God is and if God is the way a lot of people see him to be like that, why pray? Why ever pray? If God is sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent, and he's going to do whatever he wants to do anyway, then why should we even bother to pray? Since he already knows what we need before we ask, why ask? What does he say in James 4, 2 then? You have not. If it is God's will to open the door, in fact, I just want you to imagine right here, I want you to see an imaginary door. Here's, here's just an imaginary door. Can you see that door right there? There it is. That's a door. If it's God's will to open that door, and I need that door opened. I am desperate for an open door. I'm, I, I need that door opened. God knows I need that door opened. He is more than able to open the door. Then why doesn't he just open the door? Right? He's God. Capable. I need. He can. Open the door. <laughs> why is the opening of this door governed by knock and it will be open to you? Come on. You ask and you receive. You seek and you find. You knock. And it will be open to you. Why? Just go with me for a second. These questions led me to something in my season that is very interesting to me. John Wesley said, say I'm listening. John Wesley said, God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. God does nothing in the earth except. Now the first time I heard that I thought, I don't know if I believe that. I mean, he's God. I can't box him in like that. I mean, God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. The truth was, I don't think I liked it because I didn't like the responsibility it put on me. I don't like to think that would be true. I would rather believe, you know, that 
or should I say, I think some people would rather blame God than take any responsibility. But even in my searching this thought out, another thought came. If that be true, and I believe it is, that God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer, you know what that really means? That God restrains his own desires in order to co-labor with man. God restrains his own desires in order to co-labor with man. Just follow me a second on this. This is fascinating to me because the truth is let's just look at who God is. For one thing, he's the God of the universe. If I could, I'd love to show you pictures of the universe because it's one of my favorite subjects in the world. I love to look at the stars and talk about it. We ain't got time. But go with me in your mind. Think about the universe we're, we're in right now. It's mind-boggling. Our greatest minds that's ever lived can't have a, fathom a fraction of it. The billions of galaxies that are containing billions of stars. He knows every star by name. With the span of his hand, Isaiah said, he sets the heavens. He is something else. He's got it all out here spinning on nothing but the power of his word. He knows every star. Like I said, by name, calls them out like an army. And yet he knows when the bird falls on the one called earth. Oh, he's something. When you look at what he's made. And you look at the woes of our world or the circumstances in your life. It's not like that God wouldn't know what to do. Look at the nations that are in chaos. Look at at the despair in cities. Look in your own family. Look at these messes. And then look at that God. That's why it's so easy to say, you know, a lot of the world does. If you're God, why don't you do something? And then the deal is, too, it's not like we we don't know what he wants to do. He has made it abundantly clear in his word what his desire is. He has made us know without a shadow of a doubt his will and his desire. He shrouds himself in mystery to be sought out by true seekers that want to seek him out in this word. The, the, The natural minds call it foolishness. And yet God is hidden in all of it. I love that. He makes it clear in his word, especially three things abundantly clear. What is your desire, God? I'm not willing that any would perish with it, but all would come to repentance. Whoa. He says, I don't want anybody to be lost. He says, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. In other words, he wants you whole. He wants you healed. He wants you walking in health. He wants you walking in with a place where all of your needs are fully met, that you would not lack anything. That's the good heart of your father. He's telling us in this word, you want to know how I want it? You want to know what my will is? That's what I want. Oh, I'm not willing that any would perish. Nobody, not a Muslim, not a Buddhist, not a, I don't want anybody to perish. But here's the deal. If God's, if God is, if it's his will, there's, it's going to happen and nothing anybody can do about it, it's going to change it. Well, hmm. Is there, are there people lost? It's not his will that they're lost, right? Are there people sick and in lack? What's wrong? What's wrong? Unless. Matthew 16, 19. Is a key. I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Come on. God created man for fellowship, relationship, and co-laboring with his will in the earth. Think about that. When God had this big idea, he had this idea to co-labor with man in the earth. That was his idea for fellowship, for relationship. When I think about that, part of me says, God, why would you do that? Part of me says, too, I don't know why you would do that. But then I think of what the earth would be like if we did not have that kind of a relationship. Or that if he had not created that kind of relational plan. Then the earth would look like a bunch of robots. Just forcing. What if if he were to come, as some people think evidently he should, and just force his will on the earth? Well, then we'd be just a bunch of robots walking around here with his forced will on the earth. That's not what he wanted. If there were no choice, there would be no love. 
Now look at me and get this. Why did God create man in the first place and put him on this dot called earth? You want to know what I believe is the real reason? Because he wanted to love and be loved. He wanted to love and be loved. When God created man and put Adam and Eve in the garden, what did he do? He said, hey, Adam. Now, God knew who he was the whole time. And he was actually the one doing it all. But he loved letting Adam think he was helping out. <laughs> Adam, I'm going to fix this garden for you. Let's do it together. All right? You're my son. I'm so proud of you. Look at the girl. Look at El Eve, my beautiful girl. Adam and Eve, I'm going to give you authority over the whole thing. Over all of it, all the animals. Hey, come here, Adam. Let's name all the Adam animals. Look, look, come here. Come here, my friend, my son. Let's do this, Adam. Look, I'm going to make one. Look, I'm going to stretch this neck out long. Look at that one. You like that, Adam? Look at that. What you want to call him? Yeah. I like that giraffe. That's a good one. Let's do it. I like that one. Hey, Adam, look. Let's do this one. What you think? Okay. A longer nose? We'll do it. You like that? You like that nose? Well, I like it. What you would have called him? Good elephant. Wonderful, Adam. Good job. He loved collaborating. He wanted us to dream with him. He wanted us to, cre to create with him, to think with him. He gave us the authority of this place until a thief came and took it. And when we obeyed the thief, we became the, the slave to the new master. Because whoever you obey is who you are the slave to. But aren't you glad that God did not settle with things the way they were? Come on. Aren't you glad God didn't say, well, look at that one. That's just, well, what happened? Look at that. Well, I'll just have to settle with where we are now. No, God was not a settler. God said they've given away the authority I've given them and I've got a plan. I'm coming myself to get it back. Come on. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came to the earth. To take back the authority we had given away because he was the only one that could do it. He took back the authority. He stripped the enemy of all of his power. Then he looked back at you and me and he said, here it is. You've got my name. You've got my word. You've got my blood. I'm giving you back the authority, the power over all the power of the enemy. I give now you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Your job. In other words, the truth is we can do now what originally he had desired for Adam and Eve. And that was to co-labor with God. Authority in this earth. Walking in the power of his name. He gave us with them the intimacy back. The authority back. The co-laboring, what does that mean? Now then, as sons and daughters of God, we lived in this messed up world. What does God do? When God sees a need, watch me and listen. When God sees a need in the earth, he doesn't just step down out of heaven and go, Ooh, look at that need right there in the middle of Cincinnati. I need to get down there and see to that. God doesn't, he came once. And he's so powerful, one time's all it took. No, when God sees a need in Cincinnati, when God sees a need, what does he do? He starts looking for a man. Come on. I see the lost in Cincinnati. I'm not willing any would perish. I don't want that. That's not my desire. But he doesn't just step down. That's what I mean. He restrains that desire. Can you imagine how much God loves the kind of restraint that takes? No wonder the Bible says the eyes of the Lord search to and fro, just looking every day for somebody he can get his will through. Because intercessors become conduits of faith to get the will of God from heaven through them to the earth. When God sees a need, he looks for a man or a woman. He didn't care about the gender. He didn't see a need for somebody to preach. And he went, oh, I need somebody to word here. Oh, there she is. Oh, too old bad's a woman. Got to find somebody else. <laughs> He's just looking for anybody saying, God, take me. I'm willing. That's a good one. You can choose me, God. Anybody. I need somebody to get. In Ezekiel 22, 30, I ain't got time to go there long. He says, in Ezekiel twenty two thirty, 30, Israel had sinned. The lamb's going to be destroyed. Look at the heart of God. I don't want it destroyed. What does he do? I, Ezekiel twenty two thirty 30 says, I searched for a man to see if there was anybody. 
that could stand in the gap between sin and judgment. I need somebody that can stand between their sin and judgment. I couldn't find anybody. And so the land was destroyed. Whenever he found Israel in bondage in Egypt, what did he do? He's hearing the cries of the children of Israel. He started looking for a man. He didn't come himself. There's my man right there. That's my man, Moses. He becomes that intercessor between sin and judgment. And the children of Israel are delivered. Now listen, this book is all about people who answered that call as God was looking for a man. This whole book is written about people that said yes. Because when God sees a need and he looks for a man, if he finds a man that says, or a woman, if he says yes, the world has changed. If they say no, the world suffers for it. Yeah. Put up my little picture. I saw this the other day. Look at this. I saw this the other day. I want to ask God why he allows poverty, famine, and injustices in the world when he could do something about it. But I'm just afraid he might ask me the same question. Just let that sit right there. Yeah, go ahead. Now follow me quickly because I've got to wrap. Here's the deal, ladies. God needs you now for the circumstances that's going on in your life. He's, he needs you to get through to decree his will until those circumstances line up with that will. This kind of co-laboring with God is not just given to anybody. I'm going to tell you this. This is the truth. Because God's not a Santa Claus or a sugar daddy or somebody you can just go bossing around. He's God. But he's given us access to him and that access, to be honest with you, is still restricted to his friends. But you can become a friend of God. Don't you want to be? Yes. It's not just for anybody who wants to go bossing God around. It's for those who say, I want to be your friend, to hear your word, co-laboring with your will, walking with you like Adam and Eve in intimacy. And then that, in that, Lord... I, have, I see these needs that you're showing me. Because well, how does God see a need through your eyes? How does he see the need in the earth? Through Karen sitting in a red light looking at a bunch of kids sitting on the hoods of their cars. That's God looking through my eyes saying, hey, there's a need. Would you work with young people? That's how he sees a need. And he calls a friend. I want to be a friend, don't you? Now, here's where I want to say this. Jesus came to the earth. I'm going to have to hurry, so walk with me in thought. When Jesus came to the earth, this is a big deal to me. He came to the earth to teach us what we had lost in the original garden. He was trying to teach the disciples what it looked like to co-labor with God. So Jesus walked around in this intimate relationship with his father. And he said stuff like, I don't do anything except what I see my father do. I don't say anything except what I hear him say. So he was teaching these 12 boys how to be co-laborers with God. He was desperately trying to teach them. He only had three and a half years to do it. And he, was, he knew he had a big job. And it's just beautiful to watch him. How he revealed really what he expects of you and me in collaboring with his will when you see a need. Things like this. Okay, first let me say this. He, he responds, when I say collaboring, to our prayers. That's what collaboring is. We are walking in intimacy with him. We're hearing the will of the Father and decreeing it. So, for instance, they see a need. There's 20,000 people, approximately 5,000 men, women, and children to feed. There's the need. What does Jesus say? They, they, well, the disciples first walk up and say, Now, Lord, we need to send these people away. They, they're so tired. They've been here all day, and they're all getting hungry. And basically, they're probably saying, We're tired too, Lord. We just don't need to go eat. Do you know what Jesus' answer is? 
You feed them. Go read it. It's in the passage. I believe it's the one in Mark. There's more than one, but there's, I think it's the one in Mark. Jesus' answer to them, his first response, you feed them. In other words, there's so much said in that. He would never have told those disciples to do something they couldn't have done. He was trying to make them understand, I want you to, to learn how this works. If you see a need, do something about it. What did they fail the test miserably? Of course. He says, you feed them. Philip's like, Lord, it'd take us months to go work and earn enough money to get enough food to feed all these people. And what does Jesus do? Bring me the bread and the fish. Bring me the bread and you watch. You watch. All of you watch right there. And he takes the loaves and the fish and he's teaching them, this is how you do it. I'm going to co-labor with my father. There's a need. I know I can hear him telling me what to do. Just find out what you got and let's take what we got. Just two little fish and five loaves of bread. We're going to co-labor because we're utterly dependent on him. We can't do it in the flesh. You know that. I know that. you got the mind of the flesh. you got a logical idea. That ain't going to work. we got to have God. So I'm going to lift up my hands and give thanks for what I got. And he feeds the multitude. The boy needed deliverance that was possessed by a devil. And the disciples over there are trying to cast it out, doing their best. And finally Jesus comes and over there and the father says, I brought them to your disciples and they couldn't help me. I love Jesus' response. How long must I tarry with you? How long is this going to take? Bring the boy to me. You boys watch right here. And then he rebukes them. Because they came back and said, why couldn't we do it? He said, you don't have enough faith. I love this one. It shows how much he waits for our response. When, he's, when there's a need, listen, people just think, well, God knows. He knows. It's not enough that he knows. He knows every need on the earth right now, and there's still a need. He knows every single one. He knows that people are being abused. He knows you've got a need in your life. It's not enough that God knows. That's not his plan. He planned to co-labor with us. So I love one of the passages in Mark 6. You can go read it. I don't have time. When the disciples are on the boat, Jesus has gone to pray. And he's been praying there through the night. He sent the disciples on ahead to go to the other side and get things ready. He's going to go pray. And the Bible says in Mark, I believe it's Mark 6, the Bible says that Jesus, you know, he looks out from where he's praying and he sees the boat. They are in a terrible storm. And the Bible says, I, in fact, I think I am going to have to just read you this little verse. Hang on. Hang on. It's too good. It's, it's so easily overlooked. Look at this. Mark 6, verse 47. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. And he saw they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning. See, he didn't even come when he saw they were in trouble. He just let them row a minute. Yes. He didn't just run out there. He could have taken off running on that water. Come on. He could have just appeared. Boom, he's God. What? Watch. He saw them and finally, say finally. finally. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. Look at the next sentence. And he intended to go past them. <laughs> he intended to go past them? Are you kidding me? What, you know what that means? He saw they were in trouble. He wouldn't, he, the, the co-laboring concept with God means when you call me, I'll answer you. You want to do this by yourself? I'll let you. You're getting awful tired out there rowing, aren't you? So he's so sweet, he didn't stay on the hill. He's so sweet, he thought they're in trouble. I'm going to wait. Because I know how this works. They call, I'm going to come. So what does he do? He just walks out there on the water. He didn't intend to just let that boat just sit right there. He's going to pass right by him and go on to the other side where he's going to get ready for another meeting. And the Bible says, finally, they cried out, Jesus! And as soon as they cry out, 
I want to wrap right here. I know you're wondering why this is up here. Let me just tell you another little thing that I felt in my spirit for you this morning. I think sometimes when you hear these kind of messages, you're like, you know, that's great for you. Um, I tried that. And I prayed. And it didn't happen for me so far like it has for you. And... Um, I appreciate the concept. And for some of you today, in some ways, and I think for some people, they've just given up. That's why Jesus told us in Luke 18, this is so important. He gave us an example in Luke 18 of what it really looks like to co-labor with God. Okay? Co-laboring with God sometimes means I pray, boom, I get my prayer answered, and that's my favorite. But he also gave us plenty of examples that says, now, when you're praying and co-laboring with God for his will in the earth. He, Luke 18, 1, he says, I'm going to teach you how to pray, or I'm going to say how to co-labor, and then this little phrase, and never give up. Right. And what does he do to do that? He shows them an example of a woman. Aren't you glad it was a woman? Because women can pray. I could, if I could talk to that woman, it was probably about her kids. That she stood in front of that judge, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And Jesus said she stood there until the unjust judge says, I'm going to give this woman what she wants because she is driving me crazy with her constant request. And then Jesus said, now that's the way. He said, don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. He said, I tell you, he will give them justice and he will give it to them speedily. What do you mean speedily? I've been standing here for 16 years and it's not speedily. No, it means when he answers, baby, it's going to come. It's going to come like a flood. When God answers, it's overwhelming. You don't even hardly know what to do with it. He comes speedily when he comes. He said, when you pray and you co-labor with me, don't you give up when you don't get what you asked for after one or two times or three months or seven years. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. He said, I'm going to tell you how to co-labor, pray, and never give up. Sometimes people give up and they don't even know they've given up. They just developed a theology that makes them feel justified in their quitting. You know why you quit? Because sometimes hope hurts. Sometimes hope hurts. Because when you've been, when you've believed something for a long time, it's kind of like that little Shunammite woman, 2 Kings. This little woman, I don't have time to tell you her whole thing, but she was a precious lady because I like her so much. She was a wealthy woman and, and, and she actually loved God. I can tell that because when Elijah came to her to, through to, to their town, she told her husband, well, she'd been cooking him dinner. He'd been coming to eat her house. So she told her husband, this man, she said, I perceive he's a holy man. So let's build him a little, a little room on our house, and let's fix him a little bed and a table. And every time he comes through, I want him to stay here. She didn't do that for Elijah because he was a normal man or an ordinary man. She did that because he was a holy man. And this woman had something in her for God. And so Elijah had picked up on that thing. And so Elijah says to Gehazi, his servant, he said, hey, I want to do something for that woman. He said, go, go ask her what we can do for her just to thank her for her hospitality. Her answer is so interesting. She said, I don't need anything. I don't need nothing. Well, Gehazi goes back and tells Elijah, well, she don't want nothing. He says, no. Gehazi says, but you know what? She has no son. She has no children. She says to Elijah. Elijah says, get her in here. So he looks at her and he says, about this time next year, you're going to be holding a son in your arms. Look at her response. Oh, don't deceive me like that. She said, don't let me get my hopes up. She's a woman 
that had been hurt so many times by hope that even the promise sounded like deception. Because there's sometimes you've been hurt so many times by hope and believing. You can't take the pain of hoping. So you just learn to live without the thing you've hoped for. Because it's easier to live without it than to risk the pain of another disappointment. But when you throw away your hope, which is the simple belief that things will change. When you throw away your hope, you've thrown away your faith. Because like, like Ashley said last night, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things I cannot see. It's me, it's me looking at my daughter when she was in such deception and darkness, but I couldn't see her that way because in my hope, I saw Lindsay full of faith, full of God, full of the Holy Ghost, restored to her family. That was hope. I was looking at something that in the natural I could not see. But what was that? It was my hope. Even though that was screaming at me every single day and getting worse by the day and by the hour. But my hope said, no, I'm staring at this right here. This is my hope. That's my hope. What is that? That's my faith. Because that hope right there of what she's going to look like someday, that is called faith. It's my substance of things that I'm hoping for. When you throw that away, you've thrown your faith away. The Shunammite woman had been so let down by hope. She wouldn't even tell Elijah that she even had a desire anymore. Those promises, don't, even, don't deceive me with that. Don't deceive me with another promise. I've heard those promises so many times that in my own heart that it's okay. Don't, don't even tell me that. Just don't. I, I know. I, I remember when I tried to believe those kind of promises. And I believed I was pregnant. And, I stood on the word. I was pregnant, and I told all my friends that I was going to have a baby, and I found out I wasn't. It was wrong, and I remember, I remember getting a promise, believing God that someday my son was coming home. I got all excited and believing, telling all my friends he was coming home, and it got worse instead of better. And now he's in jail, and I remember, I remember when, I remember when I was believing God for healing. I was praying for him for healing. He didn't, he didn't happen. He didn't get healed. He didn't. It just didn't happen. I remember praying for money. I remember praying and believing God. I remember the promises, all about those promises. God's going to meet the need. And, 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 and it didn't happen. So don't, don't deceive me with another promise. I don't want another promise. I can't handle that. I'm tired of looking like a fool. I'm just going to believe in God and worship God and serve God. But don't talk to me about that. Not that. I, it's okay. I'm okay. I'm okay to live without it. What do you need? I don't need nothing. Cried my last tear over it. I buried that hope. But when Elijah said the words about this time next year, you're going to hold a sign. I just believe when the word was given that little lady, deep in her, even though her response was, don't say that. When that word came out of Elijah's mouth representing God, come on, the water of the word just doused that dormant seed down inside of her. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when that water hit that seed, hope started quivering again. Come on. She thought it was dead. But some, somehow that word just put, that hope just started kind of moving. Come on. And faith started being awakened again. And what did it mean? And it said, and sure enough, that time next year, that lady was holding a baby in her arms. When Lindsay was gone, when Lindsay was gone, this is where I will wrap. When Lindsay was gone, I got to a place where it just had seemed so long in believing and promise after promise after promise after promise. And I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'd, I'd gotten to a place where I, I didn't even want to read the story of, of Lazarus in the Bible. I just skipped it for months. Because I was thinking, God, if this thing dies, if, if this, all these things in me die, this hope that she's going to ever come back home again. She'd gone from relationship to relationship. It was just a nightmare. And I was thinking, God, if she doesn't come home, and I just, if this thing dies, I don't know if I've got faith to see it resurrected. I don't know how to believe for this. I don't even, how many times did I say, I just don't even know how to believe anymore. 
In that season, I remember one day when it was coming toward it looked like the final end. Where everything looked like it was going to be over. I pulled out my Bible. And I realized, for me, Lazarus is going to die. And I don't know what God's going to say to me in this, but I need to find it. And how to believe is when something's dead. How do you believe when hope is in a tomb? So I began to read, and I rem- I've, I've got to the story that I've read how many times in my life. And as I was reading that day in such desperation for faith, I hit something that changed my life. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she ran out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Now, I got to tell you something. Martha gets a little bit of a bad rap, you know, because, I mean, she was, she was a little bit busy and distracted. And how many of us relate to Martha? I do. I'm working on it. But in this situation, listen, Martha is a hero. I believe Martha, I believe Lazarus came out of that grave because of this girl. Now, Mary loved Jesus. She was a worshiper, and I love that. But when it came down to the hopelessness, Mary had stayed in the house. But something inside Martha is quivering. Now, I love Martha because I related to her. Because I'm telling you, when Lindsay, when it got into December, after this two-year battle, I thought the battle believing for my daughter was intense. When that battle turned between the battle between me and God, that was the hardest battle I've ever faced in my life. I remember days of dark despair like I'd never experienced. When it looked like promises, I had stood, screamed, proclaimed, announced, told people, all of this. And now it looked like it was not going to happen at all. I remember, I remember the deepest, darkest day saying, God, God, this was in December of 15. I remember saying, God, if these promises do not come to pass, I don't know how to believe you for anything. I don't know if I've ever heard your word on anything in my life. If these promises do not come to pass, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever heard you on anything. I don't know how. I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't know anything anymore. The battle for faith. And to be honest with you, the battle is just not even being offended at him, the one you love the most. Where are you? Where are you? Don't you know Martha was feeling that those last few days before Lazarus was dead? Can't you imagine Martha in that house, the busy Martha, taking care of his bedding, taking care of all of his bedpans, taking care of him, getting everything he needed? Don't you know Martha had some questions when she was thinking, you know, you know, I, 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 we, we, we've been friends of Jesus for so long, and, 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 and I've sent word, I've sent, in fact, I heard Jake's preach something about this one time, nobody can tell it like him, but I'll do my own version here. He said, Martha was like, you know, I've cooked for him, and, and I've, I've been here, I've washed his clothes I've, I've, for Jesus, I've, I've taken care of him, I know he'll be here, I know he'll come, so listen, hey, listen, I need you to go get Jesus, because uh, with Lazarus, I'm, he's getting worse instead of better, this ain't looking good at I know he'll come because he's always been here for us. And he stayed with us for days. He, he, I, I've taken care of him a lot. I've, I've loved him and he knows I love him. And he knows he loves Lazarus too. And he's his best friend. Can you go get him? Can you go find him quick? She's over here doing what she does. And Lazarus is not looking good. Every day she's looking up. And he finally here, he come, Gerard comes back. And he says, I found Jesus. And, and what, is he coming? Can he, can he get here quick? Well, he was just sort of over there, and mm, he was just hanging out with sort of the disciples. <laughs> he just sort of waiting around there. <laughs> I know he's going to come. I know he'll be here. She keeps taking care of him until finally <laughs> her hope breathes its last breath. <laughs> God, what happened? I was there when he needed me, I thought. I thought I was there when he was wanting me. And I needed him. Now they're coming and putting my brother in this tomb. 
He's been here four days. I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know what to believe. She's hanging around that tomb. Everybody else has gone home. Somebody comes and says, he's coming. Who's coming? Jesus is coming. They told Mary. Mary was too grief stricken. She just didn't bother. But Martha. He's coming. He's late, but he's coming. I don't understand it. I don't know where he's at. I'm heading, I'm heading down the road. Come on. When she sees him coming. A little bit of a broken heart and even a little bit of a fence. You'd been here. If you'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. But two words. But even now. Even now. God will give you whatever you ask. Two little words, even now. Even now, he's dead and he's stinking and he's rotting in a grave and it's more hopeless than it's ever been. But even now, even now, everybody else is going home. But even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She didn't know what he would say. She didn't know if he would just say, well, Martha, let's just come with me. I want to comfort you in your sorrow. You're going to have to accept this. She just looked for his word. When Jesus heard those two words, can you imagine what happened? He couldn't resist himself. Immediately he responded. He exploded. When she said, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. He looked at her and he said, your brother will rise again. Oh, yes. Because when God hears faith, he cannot resist. He explodes on the scene. Your brother will rise again. I love Martha because her faith wasn't perfect. I need people like this. She didn't just explode and say, let's go. She said, oh, I know he'll rise. On the last day, that whole religious thinking sort of kicked in, you know. And Jesus didn't let that destroy the faith that he'd already heard. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Let's go to the grave. They walk to that tomb. And I love what Jesus says. Roll away the stone. And sweet little Martha, once again her faith wobbles. Lord, he's been dead four days and he's stinking now. (laughs) And even that didn't keep her miracle from coming. Come on. He had already heard and even now. He had already heard just a little bit of, it don't take a lot of faith. It just takes two little words. Just give me a a little grain of mustard seed. Just a little bit of faith. I don't need much. I don't need perfect. I just need a little bit. Lord. Lord, now, it's been four days and he's stinking now. I love what Jesus said. He gave gave her a little kind rebuke. Check it out. He goes, Martha. (laughs) Didn't I tell you? You would see the glory of God if you would believe. (laughs) And then he tells him, Lazarus! Where'd that come from? Two words even now. Lazarus! I know you're dead. I know it's completely hopeless, but come forth. Can you imagine Martha standing there with her little bitty even now faith trembling all over her? When that stone is rolled away, she sees the silhouette of her hope walking toward her. Her faith became sight. Her faith became sight. My God, my God. Oh, it's him. It's the one I love. It's him. almost done and I'd let you keep standing but give me two minutes turn that stone around I came to tell somebody right now I made up my mind when Lindsay was gone I made up my mind I made up my mind come here I made up my mind 
my daughter's marriage. My daughter, it looks like her life spiritually is in that tomb. And it's as hopeless as it's ever been. I don't know if there's any, there's any in the natural. It looks so, dis, it looks so desperate. And my decision is, when I got that word, I decided one thing. All right? It's hopeless. But if I takes it, I'm going to pack my bags. And everybody else I know has already left Karen and said, it's over and you need to accept things like they are. Karen, it's been years now. You and your little promises, you've been telling everybody, I made up my mind. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to camp out on a tomb. I got my suitcases. I got my lunch. I'm going to scribble it right here. Even now. Even now. I got my eyes on the road. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know how he's going to do it. But he's going to do it. I know he's coming. I know he's coming. Get up on your feet all over this room. Oh, even now, even now, even now, I was supposed to come and wake up hope in you again. I was going to wake up hope in you, but you can still believe, even now, even now. I know you've been believing for. 17 years for that boy even now even now you're still breathing you still got word in your mouth it's all he needs i'll go so far as to tell you this if you go to your grave without seeing the manifestation of that hope then go to your grave believing After two and a half years of a consistent intercession, come here, Lindsay Doss. Lazarus came back from the dead. Yep. God gave me over 40 promises in those two years. Supernatural promises. I stand here tonight, today, and to tell you, he kept every single promise. Every promise. Every one. She is restored to her husband, to her, our family, all the full restoration. My Lindsay's back. My Lindsay's back. The real Lindsay. Because the power of deception and spiritual death was no match for the one who's resurrection and life. I'll tell you one more little last promise. Can I tell them about Ashley? December the 1st, I've never told this publicly. I've told it to my team privately and different friends privately, but I want to tell you this. This is so unreal to me. It's one of the many promises. It's in the book. But on December the 1st, 2014, I was in my living room and things were horrible. It was just a nightmare. And I was just calling out to God for her return with everything I had in my being. And God spoke to me to go read the Shunammite woman that I just read to you. And I'm thinking, well, he's probably wanting me to read the part about where her son dies and Elijah raises him from the dead because that's what I'm believing for and that's good with me. So I'm reading the story because I felt like he told me to. When I got to that part, and I'm telling you, I ain't even thinking about it. I mean, this is, I'm not even thinking about this particular subject. All I'm thinking about is her. Nothing else on my mind. And I'm reading in the floor of the living room, just sitting there, rolled up, my ball just praying. I get to this little scripture right here that I didn't even expect. And it said this. Next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. What Elijah said to the Shunammite. Well, all of a sudden, I was like, 
<gasps> it was a voice. The word, you will be holding a son in your arms, came off that page like a voice. I was so shocked. You talk about a subject change. I'm praying for her to get home. God's already in the future planning a son. I was so shocked that God was telling me, you know, you're praying about her, and I see all the troubledness of your heart. Hey, but you're going to be holding a son in your arms. Lindsay and Casey's son. I realized... Whoa, not only is she coming home, she's coming home. Now, she's with another man at this time. I mean, it was a nightmare. But the Lord's saying, not only is she coming home, they're going to have a baby. It's going to be a boy, and he's going to be a Nazarite, and I'm going to use him greatly, and he's going to be Casey and Lindsay's son, and you're going to hold him in your arms. I was so blown away. I wrote down the prophetic word in my journal. I dated it. You could look at it. If you could see my Bible up close, it says it. December the 1st, 2014. I wrote up here in the margin, I will hold a son. I decreed it because I heard God say it. Okay. It was, was going to be another year and a half before she came home. But I never let go of this word. Can I tell you what happened? She, when she came home, about three months later, she was pregnant. I couldn't tell her what God had told me. It was a secret in my heart. But when she got the sonogram re re results back, I was with her at Lowe's, and there's a phone call, and I saw her hit the floor in Lowe's, and I knew, it's a boy. Because I already, I already knew, if this is a girl, we got a boy coming. But I knew it's not just a boy, it's the boy. You know what happened? He was due December 13th of 2016. You know when he came? December 1st. The day God told me he was coming. A miracle of miracles. Her water broke. Her water broke December 1st. Because God wanted to prove himself faithful. He keeps his promises. When God, look at that baby right there. Look at that miracle. Come on. This, come on. Let me just show you what Lazarus looks like. Come on. And Lazarus has a baby. This is the son of promise. Come here, buddy. Can I show you this baby to show you what a miracle looks like and to give you faith that God can do anything? Would you step back right there? Just step back. We're going to make room for some ladies. I know it seems impossible to do this. No, 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 no. We're going to pray for some ladies this, after, this morning. And I know that for some of you right now, I'm holding him because I want you to look at faith. I want you to look at what a promise looks like fulfilled when it's impossible. Okay? That's why. I want you just to look at faith becoming sight. For somebody believing for a baby, I'm just holding this little baby just for let faith become sight. Come on. But it's impossible. This may not relate to everybody, but there's some of you in this room today. You've got your, your, you need to go back to the tomb. And you need to take a rock. Thank you, sweetie. You need to take a rock at that tomb. And you need to start inscribing these words right here, even now. Come on. If you're in this room today and you say, Karen, I've got to a place in my life where hope has felt dead. And i got to have God to come for me. I'm today believing that even now God will give me whatever I ask. Step forward right now and let's pray. Come on.